Hi everyone, my name is Stephen Sheriff. I am the Events and Development Coordinator at Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, which means I'm responsible for coordinating everything Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming, um, joining in digital format, fighting the good fight against COVID-19, and still, um, and I'll have more to say about navigating the pandemic a bit later on. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to Tom Willis, who is our new audience development and outreach intern. Tom is going to be working with us this year to develop the number of young people engaging with the festival. So a very warm welcome to Tom. Um, I'm just still letting a few folk in as we go here. Um, this creative planning session is an opportunity for new participants and seasoned Doors Open Days professionals to find out what we hope to develop during this year's event. So I'd like to encourage you all to make use of the chat box if you have any questions and um, you can share resources in there um, or just join the discussion and I'll do my best to keep an eye on it as we go but um, I'll review it when we get to the end and there'll be an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Um, so I'll just quickly run through what we've got in store today. Um, I'll start off by giving you an overview of the Glasgow Building Preservation Trust and Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival. And then we're going to discuss this year's theme. We are very lucky to be joined by Ewan Leach, Director of Built Environment Forum Scotland, and Martin Mackay, Executive Director of Regeneration at Clyde Gateway. And Ewan and Martin will be saying a few words in support of our theme, Sustainable Communities. After that, we're going to talk about the ways that you can participate in the festival and consider the changes to the format for this year's event. I'll then cover submissions and highlight some resources before turning it over to you for a Q&A session. So, get us kicked off. Um, Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival is organised by Glasgow Building Preservation Trust. Glasgow Building Preservation Trust started in 1982 as the Bridgegate Trust to save the Brigate Fish Market, which was at the time threatened with demolition. Becoming Glasgow Building Preservation Trust in 1992, the trust has gone from strength to strength, rescuing, repairing and rehabilitating buildings across Glasgow in its work as a charitable property developer. And here you can see um, some of GBPT's work, the Bridgegate Fish Market, now known as the Brigate. Um, and the Kelvin Grove Bandstand, and on the next slide, you can see it reinvigorated. Um, and this is the West Boathouse, which is GBPT's current project. And here you can see um, it's just gone on site in the last few weeks. So where does the festival come in? In 1990, the then director of the Scottish Civic Trust, John Gerrard, had enjoyed Doors Open Days events um, whilst travelling in Europe and decided to bring the festival format to Scotland. Coordinated by GBPT, Glasgow and AIR played host to the first ever Doors Open Days in Scotland as part of the European Heritage Days programme um, and as the City of Culture celebrations, starting with a host of historic and architecturally interesting buildings opening the doors to the public for free over a weekend. The event has now grown to include events and guided trails. Coordinated nationally by the Scottish Civic Trust, every Scottish region now takes part. Each year in September, the festival invites the public to celebrate the country's rich, built and cultural heritage, strengthening civic pride and offering fun and educational activities across Scotland. So what does participation involve? There are three main ways in which you can take part this year. You can open a building, run a digital event or lead a walking trail. Open buildings have traditionally been the main draw of the festival. The public loves getting into see spaces that they wouldn't usually be allowed to. Since 1990, we have opened over 500 of Glasgow's buildings, and so it becomes more difficult each year to find new buildings to add to the programme. So then the challenge becomes um, for participants to offer new insight into their own buildings each year. This might be achieved by opening up a different space in a building or putting on an exhibition or an event, illuminating a lesser known part of its history. Guided walks are now a staple of Glasgow's programme. 
um, and we're very lucky to have so many people who are, who are so keen to share their knowledge of the city. It's always an exciting adventure to find out new information about the streets you walk on year in, year out. And I think that's why so many of our Doors Open Days uh, visitors have been coming for so many years. Last year, Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival, as you will know, um, was entirely digital for the very first time. Um, and hopefully the last <laughs> in its entirety anyway. Um, determined that our event would not be canceled due to COVID-19. Um, our festival participants learn new skills in order to keep telling their stories. So while of course we are very excited about the prospect of getting back into um, the prospect of the doors being reopened and getting back into buildings, um, we learned many lessons last year that will have a legacy for the event for years to come, increasing accessibility and the sustainability of our event. In 2020, we had 102 listings. Um, which was pretty good going considering it was all pulled together in a few short months in living rooms and kitchens across the city. Um, there were 4,237 tickets booked, 31,000 visitors reported by participants, um, and every re respondent to our survey uh, reported that the event was a good or excellent educational experience. Um, I'll just cast your mind back to a few of the events from last year. Uh, we had over 20 digital trails which participants made using the GuideGo app. These were downloaded. Someone coming in. Uh, these were downloaded several hundred times, and it gave the visitors the opportunity to get out and about in the city during lockdown and have something close to what resembles a normal doors open days experience. This tour that you can see on the screen now um, was of Kelvin Grove Park and it was given by Dr Rosie Spooner, um, a bit of a critical heritage trail. Here we've got um, young Susie and Susie made a film with um, her father Matt Bridgestock um, and they took us on a bike ride down the Clyde going over, taking in all of the Clyde's bridges. Um, here we have a workshop with some students of Glasgow School of Art, and they were studying with the simulation and visualization department, and they made some 3D models of the interior of the Market Cross building. The, the workshop was about digital tools that you can use in heritage contexts. Here you can see some stills from an old film that was shared as part of the festival last year. The film is from the 1960s and features old Dalmarnock um, and it's actually been watched on our YouTube channel almost 6,000 times now. Um, the film is now the subject of a project that we are working on with Riverbank Primary School where young people will be invited to consider the rich industrial past of Dalmarnock and think critically about the area now asking the question, what does a community need to exist? And that brings me quite nicely to our festival theme this year, um, sustainable communities. As I'm sure we've all heard, COP26 is coming to town in November and people across Glasgow will be considering climate change and wondering what small ways we as communities contribute to a greener Glasgow. By its very nature, as a largely community-run um, educational event, Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival contributes to our communities being more sustainable. So you might find that it's not so difficult for you to fit your event into the, this year's theme. To get us kicked off, we're going to hear from Ewan Leach. Ewan is a director at Built Environment Forum Scotland and former coordinator of Edinburgh Doors Open Days Festival, but don't let that put you off. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand over to you. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, there's nothing like a reference to Glasgow Edinburgh rivalry. Um, <laughs> quite, a, quite a long time ago that I uh, did. There was open date probably uh, eight or nine years ago, but I have to say it was one of it's been probably my favourite job during doors open day because it just it's just such a totally fun thing to do where the public are having a great day. And most of the venues um, are also having uh, a great day too. 
Um, but now I'm in a job where I work in the world of policy and trying to influence government legislation um, and things like that, which seems remote and potentially dry. Um, but it is totally relevant to what happens in the, the built environment in the heritage world. Um, and the theme of sustainability is something that is obviously of rising importance to everyone who's working um, in any field, I suppose, at present, regardless of COP26, with various environmental targets that have been set for us. Um, but I thought what it might, I might be able to share with you this morning is something that we were working on last year. The government had asked the Historic Environment Scotland, the heritage sector, to look at how we invest in the historic environment. Um, and as part of that, there was a discussion around prioritisation and how you decide where to spend money. And with BEF's wide membership and beyond, um, we developed a sustainable investment tool, which was designed as a sort of guide for people to think about how they explain what they do when they're asking funders for money. Because while most of us who are involved in things like Doors Open Day, we're interested in heritage and we understand cultural value and history as really important and a lot of the aesthetics that go along with that. Often when we're talking to other people, these are not the deciding factors in whether or not they're wanting to invest uh, in something. And what we've been doing at BEFS over the past few years is talking to the heritage sector about how we talk about the heritage sector differently. Um, not talking about it as something that's of cultural value, while that is important, there are many other things that the heritage sector delivers on um, that are just as important or to some people, even more important and arguably probably for all of us more important things about society, health, education um, and things like that. And I've just shared a link with you in the chat, which looks at what was going to be a um, consultation that was going to take place a year ago on the sustainable investment tool. And it's very much geared to looking at money. But if you look through the pot I've sent you, as you scroll down, it begins looking at how we could think about um, investing in heritage or how we talk about heritage. We say it contributes to culture, but it also contributes to society, economy and the environment. Um, and I think Stephen's touched on that around if we're doing community activities, we are providing a society benefit and we can engage with much wider communities. If you have a, a building, you are part of the economy. Um, and whether or not that's because you are a business that's operating from there, or whether or not it's because you're providing a demand for uh, repairs for your building, that's part of the economy. And if we're reusing everything that we have from the past, we're part of the environmental um, campaign because using what we've got at its optimum is going to be crucial in meeting carbon targets while adapting them and retrofitting them to make them operate as efficiently um, as possible within um, certain parameters. But the most interesting thing I think in what we shared was something that I think actually our Historic Environment Scotland who are our funder um, produced. And that was looking at all the things that we deliver as a sector for the national performance framework. And it really looks at the fact that if you have a, a building that's in use and that you're opening up, that you are contributing to society, to culture, um, to environmental issues, to economy, to um, a, a multiplicity of the targets that the government has set. And I suppose it requires us to maybe think a little bit differently about what we actually have. So you may have a site that is a historic building and um, that is sometimes open to the public, but how do we maintain that? That is providing a demand for traditional skills. The traditional skills are usually relying on traditional materials all of which can be sourced locally um, and are invariably from materials that have incredibly long uh, lifespans. And we can talk about the Hersher sector as this thing that provides a demand for um, future skills. Today, the, the, the Just Transition Commission have produced its recommendations, um, which are looking at, as we adapt to a low carbon society, how do we make sure that nobody disadvantaged by that? And I suppose, we could become a low carbon society by immediately turning off pumping oil out of the North Sea, but that would have a really dramatic impact on employment in Scotland. Um, but the answer to that is that the people who currently work in high carbon activities can find employment or should be able to find employment in maintaining the entirety of 
our built environment and that there is a if we are going to be honest about keeping all our existing buildings in use then there needs to be a, a big increase in the number of people who have skills in looking after not just our traditional buildings but all our buildings whether or not they're not made of sandstone or whether or not they're made uh, of concrete and so these are things that we can present heritage in to say we are part of the just transition and providing um, jobs for the future and maintenance is a permanent job it doesn't happen once it happens if you're responsible for a building you know it happens all the time um, and you can pitch your building around this is jobs permanently for the future but it's not just about jobs it's also about what you provide uh, for the community if you bring people together you have a community asset you're allowing people to meet to engage to identify with the history of uh, where they're from and where they live and work. And that is important for providing cohesive communities. Lockdown, everyone has talked about the fact that we've all done a lot more locally and you can, the heritage sites that are accessible to local people have all had fairly heavy uh, footfall uh, if, if they're open, still open to the public. Um, and they provide people with an anchor as to where they live. Um, Stirling University is doing quite a lot on social value and some of that information may be coming out into the public domain quite soon, which again reinforces how important certain aspects of heritage are to local communities. So you're providing that in what you do in opening uh, on Doors Open Day. But it might also be that what you, the service that is provided within your site is also a social good whether or not that's providing housing which is a social good or whether or not that's providing activities for people who have mental health issues is also a social good um, and we need to talk about what that possibility is within our site and i suppose thinking about what stephen has said and having a look at what it says on the website maybe you're not feel you're not doing any of those things and i think it's interesting at doors open day to talk about you have this asset that isn't doing those things asking your local community could it do those things? Are there things that your local community would like to see happen there um, that would be beneficial to you as a sustainable community? In COVID, many places have turned into um, food banks. We've seen in England, cathedrals have become um, uh, vaccination centers. All these sorts of things are activities that happen within our existing and historic um, built environment. And they all contribute to what we understand sustainability to be beyond the immediate retrofit or, or, or the uh, challenge of making our buildings um, more energy efficient. All these other things are part of what make a sustainable uh, community. Um, so I suppose those are some of the reflections that I would share with you that you might want to think about. I suppose, I suppose some of the challenges that some of us might have, I'm a big fan of concrete, but I know that concrete's a really evil thing when it comes to carbon. Um, but if I had a concrete site, I would be talking about the fact that we could learn from history. Um, Glasgow is a, a city that's been deeply damaged by some aspects of driving motorways through the, through the centre of it. Um, and being able to talk about that sort of thing and use aspects of our history that are, you could say, are negative, but use them as learning points for how we would do it differently now, or how fundamentally we can maybe unpick some of the damage uh, that we've done in the past to make our cities or parts of our cities uh, more sustainable. The whole point of the Just Transition uh, Commission is looking at empowering local communities to lead on uh, how we become more sustainable. And actually the European organization, Europa Nostra, have also produced a green paper, which came out yesterday, I'll put it in the links, which again is looking at how local communities can drive the demand for a more carbon friendly uh, future or zero carbon future um, and be participants uh, in making that happen, including things around transport. You might be a petrol head, but we know that that's maybe not going to be uh, something that we'll all be enjoying in the future. I'm talking about that in the context of Doors Open Day, how people access your sites and encouraging people to access your sites in the most environmentally way possible, on foot, on bike, um, is all part of showing that you are at the heart of being a sustainable community. To me, the theme, the themes for Doors Open Day are all invariably dead easy to do because you can pit, you can um, pitch your building as a good example of something or a bad example of, of something, or use it as a consultative uh, process to ask 
your participants, the people that attend, how they would like to see it change to become something that's more uh, sustainable for the future. So those are a few of my sort of thoughts on it, which are tapping your hyper-local activities into what are not just national um, uh, agendas, but into uh, global agendas. And I think it, it will be undoubtedly a great day. I mean, I'm, I've done most of the Edinburgh sites, so I don't really do Edinburgh Doors Open Day anymore, um, but I'm a regular attender at Glasgow and I've cycled around quite a few of the sites uh, on previous Doors Open Day and it's, you know, it's a huge amount of fun and I'll look forward to either visiting you digitally or in the flesh in September. Thank you so much, Ewan. Um, I think sometimes it's, it's easy to be focused on our own activities and to not consider how they feed into the work of other organisations and indeed society in a wider context. Um, so I hope that Doors Open Day is going to be an opportunity for us to build partnerships and, and create links. Um, with our, our own focus is on storytelling of our own buildings, but I think the Doors Open Days offers you know, that opportunity for um, visitors to come and tell their own stories. And so a way that you, know, you can contribute to the theme might be just offering um, a space for conversation to actually talk about these themes and um, you know, get the, the views of the visitors. Um, next, we are going to hear from Martin Mackay. I'm going to start sharing my screen again. Um, You'll be able to see that now. Um, Martin Mackay is the executive director of Regeneration at Clyde Gateway and former president of the Glasgow Institute of Architects. Um, so Martin, if you'd like to unmute yourself now, and if I, I have some slides here for you, so just let me know when you'd like me to move them on. Uh, well, that's great. Hopefully everybody can hear me and thanks very much for the invitation to, to speak today. Uh, sustainable communities is something that at Clyde Gateway we are deeply involved in and about how we can do the best for our communities. And I'm going to speak a lot bit about that today. Before I do that, I mean, I'll maybe talk about my memories of Doors Open Day. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to the very first Doors Open Day in 1990. I went on a Sunday afternoon. I was working that day. Uh, and after my shift, I was able to go and see the, the Kepi's share of court building, the kind of brutalist structure that then get uh, listed, I think, probably 2010, 2015, maybe around about then. And uh, I also got to go and see the, the Glasgow Mosque. So I was kind of hooked uh, from that day and I've enjoyed many visits uh, in Glasgow over the years and in other cities as well. The first slide I'm going to show is of the Olympia building. We'll just move on to that next slide. And that's, this is a kind of classic Doors Open Day building. Um, it's a facade retention, redevelopment by Page and Park Architects, and it's a building that's at the heart of our community. And when we started Clyde Gateway, we were committed to, to working with our communities in a collaborative way to addressing their needs and demands. Uh, and one of the first buildings that we worked on was the Olympia, because we asked the community, what did they want us to do? And this was one of the things that came up at the top of the list was to try and bring that building back into use. And well, we really threw the kitchen sink at it. We put a library on the ground floor. We put the National Centre for Boxing on the first floor. We then put two floors of offices on top of all of that to provide a bit of revenue to help run the building. Uh, and now we've got University of Glasgow in there, our own offices as well as other people. So there's a real opportunity for people to come to the Olympia building, step inside the entrance and look up at the wonderful spiralling staircase uh, as it goes up to the, the dome. And then to kind of get a look beneath the bonnet and come in and see some of the spaces like boxing that you perhaps don't see on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, when we think about Clyde Gateway as an organisation and a lot of things I do is in the kind of built environment stuff, and I'm going to speak about that today, but uh, as an organisation, we are quite simply about three things. We're about people, we're about place, and we're about jobs. And the next slide touches on that people dynamic. Um, and in terms of, of, of people, for every project that we work on, we have community benefits that run through our projects. We run STEM sessions and, and uh, with local schools, with local colleges. So every project has a story that sits behind it about how the local community and others were able to participate within that. And I think that's one of the things that the Doors Open Day has done. It's been able to allow us to bring those types of stories to the fore uh, and show how the redevelopment and regeneration of communities can be done in a positive way with people 
at its heart. The next slide is about is about place. And if you are cycling along the Glasgow walkways, I think many people are at the moment with the pandemic, then you'll come across the, this bridge, uh, which is one of the first projects that we delivered in Clyde Gateway. And it's a project that helps link up the Marmot Station to the Shawfield site. But we also, it's also called the Smart Bridge, or nicknamed the Smart Bridge. But what the reason for that, apart from the fancy lighting at night, is that underneath the bridge deck, there are two carrier pipes which are designed to take the district heating network across the river from Dumarnock into Shawfield, and we're currently constructing that in Dumarnock at the moment. And I kind of make that point. You know, when we talk about sustainable communities, people maybe think about it in terms of energy, in terms of climate resilience, and that's part of the things that we're delivering within Clyde but it's also about walking and cycling routes. It's about getting people from where, where they are to where they want to be, and it's about creating a community and a place where people can live and work. And the next slide of Cunningham Loop, again, speaks to that point about communities where people can live and work uh, and can enjoy leisure. This is Cunningham Loop on the, the banks of the river. Uh, and again, if you've been out and about in the city and enjoying the green spaces during this lockdown period, then Cunningham Loop uh, has been a space that many people have came to. And that's one where we worked with uh, local community groups, including Healthy and Happy in Rutherglen and elsewhere, to help shape and inform how the park developed. And a number of the artworks that are in the park have been delivered by, by the local community. But apart from that, it's just a great place to be. There's a cycling pump track, there's a bouldering area, all of that type of stuff. And again, this is for me is kind of classic doors open day, walking route, cycling route type stuff. You know, it's it's places where people have already been perhaps and, and been before, but it's about the opportunity to tell the bigger story uh, about the, how the project was created and how it might develop in the future. Um, and probably during doors open day this year, we'll be on site with a massive uh, extension of the park just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago as well as delivering a new building called the Bothy and the Tur uh, on the site. This is also a, a site of research where we are working with the preservation, sorry, working with uh, British Geological Society on mine workings and how those can be used for energy. The test centre is on site. Not a great thing to see, but a good story to tell. So that kind of covers it, the kind of place dimension and then I want to maybe come on to kind of jobs and, and probably highlight that through our Red Three Magenta building uh, designed by our architects uh, and this was a building that we were worried about you know about how, how we would create a, a structure and a place that people would want to come to in a, in a new and emerging area uh, but we were absolutely delighted to, to pre-let almost half of this building and then within about 12 to 14 weeks of opening we're able to uh, we're able to open the rest uh, or be able to let the rest of it. So it's a real opportunity again in doors open day to get into buildings like this uh, and see how a range of businesses are working in new and different types of spaces. And that kind of brings me on to my kind of last point about people placing jobs, you know. Uh, doors open day is as much about the buildings as the people who work in them, the people who uh, maintain that heritage. Uh, as well as modern day buildings for, for our use as well. So we'd be delighted to be part of the those open day this year. We'd be able we'd be delighted to help support people uh, in terms of how they can deliver uh, a theme of sustainable communities and we'd be happy to uh, offer our advice and experience within that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, it's really great to hear about these projects in action and uh, great to see that there's an opportunity to get into that uh, Red Tree Magenta building. I think that's something that we've been trying to do is incorporate um, more recent architectural uh, buildings into the programme, so that would be fantastic. Um, on the Glasgow Doors Open Days website, you can, you'll find a tab called Sustainable Communities and there are a few discussion points there. And I'll just run through a few of these. Um, if you're in a heritage building, you could highlight some sustainable ancient building methods and materials that have long since been abandoned. I think that was something that Ewan had mentioned earlier on. Um, you could consider organising a cycling heritage trail or a digital trail, highlighting some of the city's cycle paths. 
you could arrange a litter pick, a heritage litter pick, um, or consider how animals move around the city. I think that this theme is a real opportunity to just stop and consider the environment around you. The question um, in question, you know, the way that we have become accustomed to living, is it conducive to our own health and well-being? Are there more resources at our disposal than we thought? Or can we do more with what we've got? Um, so for your own events this year, there are many ways that you can go. And I hope the discussions today have given you some inspiration. But if you feel unsure, then we can chat at the end today, or I'll be happy to arrange a separate meeting when we can talk at length about the specifics of your own project. Um, I'm now going to talk a bit about the changes to the festival format for this year. Some of these have been brought in in response to COVID-19, um, and some were following, in from, following on from changes that we were actually planning um, in 2020 pre-pandemic, if you can cast your mind that far back. Um, so the Buildings and Guided Walks programme will run at the weekend only. Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival is the only programme in Scotland that has run over a week instead of a weekend. And of course, there has been benefits to this. It's meant that the event is potentially more accessible to certain visitors and some organisations that are not used to opening at the weekend um, can still take part. But the decision to move, to move that part of the programme to the weekend only has been made for several reasons. Um, each year, we get loads of comments from folks uh, who are disappointed when they can't get around the whole event. And I think there's a bit of a feeling among some visitors that the programme's become quite unwieldy. Um, having a smaller programme will mean that Glasgow Building Preservation Trust and myself um, can spend more resources with individual participants, assist to, assisting in the coordination of your events, focusing on marketing and encouraging visitors to visit more places. So each individual space will get more folk through the door, is our hope. Um, during the digital festival, I really enjoyed getting to know all of the participants and it was certainly a much more perhaps slightly frantic um, hands-on approach than what we have experienced in previous years. Um, and I think that this really helped with building connections for visitors and participants alike. It, it meant that I was more able to team people up. Um, and running a Doors Open Days event can really be quite a lot of work. And by having a smaller program, we hope that more people will get to see the individual listings rather than spreading ourselves thin. Um, connected to the move to the weekend, um, is the plan to have a Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival volunteer or two volunteers in every venue. The hope is that this will assist in creating a consistent visitor experience and perhaps mean that you can spend more of your own time giving guided tours, speaking about the history of your building um, with some, or with your venue, but someone else keeping an eye on the door. And we're hoping that um, to enlist a group of young volunteers to be doing this as um, the expansion of our audience is always one of our focuses. Building visits will possibly still um, have to be booked in advance um, so that social distancing can be put in place if necessary, but I don't want to anticipate that too much as we have all experienced this as a very changeable situation. So I'm going to wait till a bit later in the year to make that decision and as always I'll be very happy to hear your thoughts on this. The next two points I'll take together, um, there will not be a festival hub this year, and that is because of the uncertainty around events that draw a crowd. There are some kinds of events that I just don't think are worth doing, socially distant, unable to be surrounded by other festival goers, um, a sparsely populated festival hub with just a few folk in for one of our talks, I don't think would be very satisfactory for you, the participant, or um, for the festival audience. However, our online talks programme last year was a really huge success and because the talks were recorded, folks could have the opportunity to watch them on our YouTube channel throughout the year. And the YouTube channel has been watched, or the videos on the YouTube channel have been watched really thousands of times since last year and it's become an incredible resource for the city. So the online event programme, by which we mean the talks and workshops predominantly held on YouTube, will be taking place throughout the week. 
Um, and if you are a building who is open at the weekend, a fantastic way of encouraging folks to visit your building um, will be to put on a digital event throughout the week, offering a bit of a sneak peek. Maybe you want to do a, a Facebook video. Um, yeah, so the, the digital events will include Facebook and Instagram live tours, and these were really popular last year. I think that Govan Old Church recorded several thousand folks that actually joined uh, their, their live tour. Um, so lastly, I just want to mention that I'm working really closely with the Glasgow City Council Education Department to ensure that all of the digital resources that we made last year and hopefully we'll make this year will have a legacy. I'm developing a new website which will include an archive feature. All of the content created will be archived and tagged and relating to the curriculum for excellence and the STEM outcomes so that this is a searchable and useful tool for teachers, students and of course for the general public. And the education department will also be working with me to roll out the archive into schools, spreading the word about your organisations, the buildings and the trails and resources that everyone has made. So while we are encouraging you to align your event with the festival theme this year, we always want to be furthering our festival mission and aims, and I'm just going to quickly recap these now. Glasgow Doors Open Day's festival mission is to strengthen civic pride among Glaswegians and to broaden public awareness of Glasgow's rich built heritage at local, national and international levels by exposing a diverse audience to different aspects of Glasgow's built environment. These aims include to increase the number of Glaswegians who are engaged in celebrating and learning about Glasgow's rich built heritage, architecture and culture. To increase the profile of Glasgow as a destination for domestic and international tourists who are interested in history, heritage and the built environment. And on that one, I will say that last year we recorded 10% of our festival audience was from outside Scotland and 5% from outside the UK. The UK. Um, we had folks tuning in from all over the world, as far as Australia and New Zealand, taking part in talks and workshops. And that was really exciting to know that all of the work that you're doing really is finding an international audience. And we'll be making, we'll be looking to make the most of that possibility again this year. Um, and the last one we've got here is to provide public education and opportunities to stimulate discussion of current issues in design, planning and preservation of heritage buildings. As a Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival participant, you have certain responsibilities, and I'm going to briefly run through these now, just in case anyone's got any questions. Um, stick to deadlines set by the coordinator. Deliver your event as detailed in your initial application. Communicate any changes. Display and then return promotional material. Um, I will be asking everyone to return an evaluation by the Monday after the festival finishes. That's the 20th of September. Um, and the evaluations are so important because without these, we can't report to the funders who pay for the festival event. So I really appreciate your efforts in getting those back to me. Um, and then lastly, we've got be aware of and use where appropriate resources such as risk assessments. And these, as well as other useful information, are outlined in our participant hand information booklet, uh, which is available on the participate page of our website. So the call for expressions of interest closes on the 21st of April, so that's just less than a month. We've actually had loads of folks um, submitting their expressions of interest already, um, so thank you to those of you who have. It's really shaping up to be an exciting event. Um, you will see that the application format is different this year. At this stage, all I require is 250 words on what you would like to do and a note on how your event will link into our festival theme. And the reason it's been done like this is because, as I mentioned earlier, we're developing a new website and the new site will afford everyone their own login, which means that they, um, the details can be updated more easily. So there will be more of an, there will be more of an extensive form to fill in later on in the year, which will be used to filling in, and that will include details such as opening times and addresses, accessibility information, um, your event blurb and all these kinds of things. But in the meantime, all I need is 250 words. 
And the other benefit of doing it like this is that I will endeavour to be in touch with everyone to have a discussion about your event and to make sure that I'm connecting you with as many resources as, as possible. Um, so to submit your expression of interest, you just find the participants page on our website and click the link um, and you'll be taken to a Google form that looks like this. So in short, we are looking for events relating to the Glasgow Doors Open Day's aims and mission and theme. Events that are free to attend, it's always a free event. Um, and if buildings are usually open to the public, that they do something extra during Doors Open Days. Um, on the screen now are the contact details that you might need, as well as social media handles and important dates. I'd like to thank this, take this opportunity again to thank Ewan and Martin for being with us this morning. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for um, you know, continually showing up to these things and um, you know, making Doors Open Days, the fantastic the event that it is. Uh, you'll find resources on the Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival website on the participants page. And I'll be e emailing out a link for you to download another booklet and that has more specific information um, for helping to run an event, things like risk assessments and these kinds of things. Um, we've now got time for a Q&A. So I can see there are a couple of things in the chat box. So have a wee look through that. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question, I would encourage you just to use the um, emoji function you've got in Zoom on the bottom right hand corner and you can raise your hand um, and then I'll just ask you to unmute yourself. Any questions at all? Um, Lee asked if um, participants are able to combine experiences to host a building tour and a digital offering. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I would encourage you to be doing um, a, a digital event throughout the week that will um, add to the experience um, or give a sneak peek of the building tours that you can do um, towards the end of the week. Uh, Susan's asking on buildings would only be yeah that that would be fine it's just um at the as long as it's at the weekend or with the open open program so Saturday or Sunday is fine if your event can't really class as sustainable. Uh, Jenny if your event can't really class as sustainable then is it worth submitting or keep till next year no I would absolutely encourage you to um to submit Anyway, the, uh, the festival theme is really an effort to get the participants um, to perhaps offer something different to what they've done in, in previous years. But if, if um, you know, your event doesn't, it feels like a stretch, then please do um, apply anyway. Um, it really is just a guide and, and, and so, so hopefully it's something which is helpful to, uh, you know, uh, uh, creatively for you. Um, so it, it's not it's not absolutely rigid. So please do apply anyway. Um, Stuart, I can see your hand is up. So just if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, just a, just a quick question for you. Um, last last year when you put the map of the Castle Stables up, that we we thought that worked really really well. That that map. Say for instance, we have a situation where we can't go into the building. We couldn't take. Um, uh, people we, we would like to do a digital offline but we'd also like to do something where we could take you know we would have to book onto this could we kind of offer that if it because what i'm a little bit concerned of is that because of we don't know what's the situation with lockdown if we we say we're going to do something and then we have to change it basically is that okay is there a lot of flexibility in this because our chief executive's just going to ask that really to us that what, what's your flexibility because we don't we don't want to put something down and then people turning up kind of thing that we, we just need to be quite flexible this year. 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are very much at the mercy of um, the restrictions that are imposed on us. So, yeah, I mean, I really want to see us all getting back into buildings and that's what we're going to aim for. But I mean, of course, you know, if the, the advice suggests otherwise, then we'll have to um, be able to flip. And that's why um, everyone who submits is encouraged to have a digital offering as well. So that if it, it turns out that we can't get into buildings, then your entry in the program, there will still be something there. And that will be something that I will be um, getting in touch with everyone individually about to, to see if we can um, assist you in developing a digital offering. Thank you, Professor Rhodes. Um, Carolyn, do you have a question? Yes, I, I'd put it in the chat. It was just to kind of get a wee bit of advice um, from you. If you're starting to see listings coming in or ideas coming in from people, I'm aware we're in the West End, we're at Kelvin Hall and Kelvin Grove Museum, and there's a union, there's a lot of other buildings quite often that do take part. And it's just to make sure we don't end up kind of doing something similar or, or duplicating. Is that something you could maybe, as you're seeing things coming in, you're maybe able to either see an overlap or see a gap and say, well, they're already doing that, but how about this? Is that something you could kind of help us with? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's one of the benefits of doing it like this year, because I'm hoping to, you know, before all the submissions would come in and generally everyone that submits, you know, is included in the festival anyway. Um, but this year with sight of it, I'll be able to perhaps guide folk um, or yeah, create links, um, maybe sharing resources that are going to be especially useful, um, you know, making ourselves more sustainable, I suppose. Um, Mary, do, sorry, does that answer your question? Maybe you've gone. Mary? Uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, we, we've got the... 1820 um, Memorial on Site Hill um, for um, about the 1820 Rising and so on. Uh, I've, I've still got the video, obviously. Um, would that just do for if we have a, a digital option, you know, if we have to have a digital option rather than make another video, um, just use that again because, you know, it's still the same memorial, it hasn't changed. Um, so we could do that. But one other aspect of thought, um, I was interested what, um, I think it was Martin talked about um, international tourism. Um, there are there is some interest, or always has been some interest in Australia about this because there are descendants of the people who were transported. Some of them know their descendants, some of them don't. Um, is, would there be a way that I mean, will, will Glasgow Doors Open Day um, maybe be promoting itself internationally a bit for people? Last year. The 1820 Society was actually arranging for a bunch of Australian descendants to come to Scotland to um, view the memorial, but also to do a tour of Scotland, of course, and, and so that would be bringing in tourism. Um, that didn't happen um, last year. Um, it was supposed to tune in with the, the 200th anniversary, um, but um, I, I don't know, it probably won't happen this year either. I mean, I think international travels are no-no, but, um, you know, maybe digitally, if we could advertise um, in Australia, <laughs> um, yeah. maybe bring some more people. But will there be, I mean, what will be the reach? Would, would Glasgow maybe be um, advertising itself abroad a wee bit digitally so that Australians who are descendants and know their descendants and are interested in this kind of thing could tune in? and maybe come a, a later year or something, just to spread it. Thanks, Mary. Um, I will answer your first question um, first. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. If you made digital content last year, there's no need for you to, um, you know, to remake using the same material. I think that one thing that was flagged by some of the participants is that, and this is another benefit of having a slightly smaller program, is that you know, all of that material didn't necessarily find, you know, its audience, like there's more work to be done with the content that's already been created. And that's something that I want to make sure that's part of the effort of um, having this archive and putting it out to the educational um, to the education department. Um, so no, like, please don't feel like you have to make the same video again, I would maybe, you know, consider making something slightly different. Um, but yeah, if you have already made digital content, then there's no need to do it again. We could, sorry, um, one thing I thought we could do, having seen the video, I thought maybe add in some stills of the monument and, and talk over them a bit because uh, the video 
talked a lot about the history of it, but it didn't actually show you the, the, the monument very well. Um, that, that's just the way it turned out. So I'd quite like to add in some stills just, um, you know, and, and talk over them a wee bit. But that's all I would do, if, just keep yeah, me... well, like the each The hope is that each building eventually will have its own page on this archive. And so each year you participate in doors open days, you can be building up the number of resources that are on there. Um, because the, the, the archive will be something which is constant, because that's obviously very important if they're going to be um, cited in educational resources, that it's always there. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll be adding to this and it'll be something that will become a really incredible resource in years to come. Um, for your second question about international participants, and it was you that I was actually thinking of um, when I was talking about the, the folk tuning in from Australia last time. Um, I think this is something that you know I would love to to be assisting with uh, on an individual basis with participants. Now, if I'm going to have more time working with a smaller number of participants, then um, it would be great for us to kind of eke out in our conversations. What, what are the possibilities that you know I could use with my resources, with my time? So perhaps you know for this, I could be finding historical societies in in Australia and then flagging you know your event. Yeah. To those. So these are the kinds of things that you know yep. the kind of conversations I would love to have with you all and, and really maximize um the, the reach of, of your events. Historical and genealogical, because some of them are descendants, you know, and people that are into genealogy, they really light up if they suddenly realize that they're descendants from a revolutionary <laughs> who was transported 200 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think some of the, the people that were joining from uh, your talk were getting up at ungodly hours of the morning to, exactly. <laughs> to, to get involved so it was yeah. really fun um emma do you have a question emma mclean hi um yes i've got a question um so we're we haven't actually taken part in doors open uh, before so we're from the the ramshorn building and we're, we're really keen to to be involved this time round. but it, it's more about the guide deal as if that's how Gaidigo, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we we already have some resources um, developed already on digital trails and like three D scans of the building. And I just wondered what if there was flexibility on using those, even though they're developed on a different app or software. Um, I just wanted to know what the flexibility is on using things that we already have. Um, just yeah. because it's quite difficult for us to access the building just now. Um, so yeah, just. That, yeah, absolutely. I mean, last year we um, we had a partnership with guide to go and um, we were able to offer all of our participants free access to the app. So that's the one that like I kind of, it was a mad dash to um, get your head around all of these different digital technologies. And this is the one that we focused on. But if you're already working um, with a different app, absolutely. I think um, it will just be necessary to have really clear instructions for visitors to, you know, um, teach them how to how to use these things but yeah there's no need to to stick to the ones that we use and like honestly there might be better ways of doing things like as i said last year it was kind of it was um everything had pulled together quite quickly so uh there's going to be lots of other uh, technologies that we're not so aware of yet and i would love to um speak to you about you know the kinds of things that you've been using that's great that's really helpful thanks very much um, I saw a question from David about David Wiley about the guided go tours. Um, I think someone else has actually answered it, but yes, the I can look this up for you. But um, if you log into the guided go yourself, you can see um, the number of times that your tour has been downloaded. It's just included in the analytics on that site. Um, are there any other questions I've missed? No? Anyone? Okay, well, if there aren't any questions, um, then we will just finish up. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again for, for being with us, and um, I'm really excited to, to talk to you about uh, your projects this year. So um, if there are any other questions, then you can get me on email. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to arrange a meeting with you.
then. But uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming.